Hello in next episode uh, of stories for, from the ABA. Uh, my uh, guest is today Alexis Ajinsa. Hello, Alexis. Hey, how you doing? Very good. Thank you very much for uh, finding time uh, for us. Uh, we will talk about your uh, basketball career. Um, on the wall, there are some hints uh, about uh, what about some stages in your career in the NBA and uh, as I guess it's also national team jersey with the 14, am I right? Correct, it is. Okay, so let's start with, uh, with the time um, before NBA. Uh, who was your favorite player when you were a kid? Uh, favorite player when I was a kid? Um, I was always fascinated by big men, obviously because I was tall, so um, I had three guys. I had Kevin Garnett that I was always looked up to, um, mostly because he had the kind of same morphology, like same body style that I have, um, you know, skinny and be able to jump and everything. So when I grew up, a lot of kids, a lot of players of my age were comparing me, my style of game to, K to Kevin Garnett. Um, so it was Kevin Garnett, Akeem Olajuwon. I love his post moves. And, uh, and the third one was Dirk Nowitzki. Um, because uh, first he was European, he was German, so I love that that he's from you know the same uh, continent than me, than, my, than me. So I was like, I was look up to that. Also, he was a big man that could shoot the ball, so I thought it was amazing because we don't really see that uh, that often back then. Uh, so I was like, well, that's that's what I want to do. I want to do the same thing that he's doing with all the games I can bring up. So I guess that you, when you've got the chance to play for a while uh, for the Dallas Mavericks uh, and uh, you're one of your favorite players, uh, Dirk was your teammate. It was one of the dreams which comes true. Yeah, totally. And uh, and then I told him that, you know, he was like, well, he never knew, but he uh, also like, you know, thought it was kind of cool. So I was like, yeah, I enjoy it. So how it was uh, to, to meet Kevin Garnett on the court? At first it was awesome. Then he started doing a little uh, trash talking, and I was like, okay, I guess it's, that's how it is, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so from this uh, dream from, uh, from the childhood, uh, I guess that, uh, that it wasn't so easy to uh, become the NBA player. So how do you remember this journey uh, from the first time when you got the ball in the hand till the moment that you was on the first practice in the NBA? Um, I mean, it was a long journey. Um, I started basketball late. So I started around, I think, uh, 11, maybe 12. Um, I knew nothing about the sport. My family knew nothing about the sport. Um, and I just decided to just go with it. You know, so I was actually was terrible at it. I, I was very bad. Uh, my teammate was making fun of me till I started getting serious with it. And, uh, and then, you know, every steps were counted. So, you know, uh, I think in, after I started in three years, the third year, I ended up being uh, recruited by um, the best French academy in step where most of the French player play, uh, came from and um, come from still to this day. And, uh, and then after that, we did three years there and become pro, um, become pro, was not playing that much and changed team, played a little bit more and boom, I got drafted. And to me, it was like, well, everything happened so fast, but it also was a long journey. I had to, you know, make my way up, completely up and trying to, you know, find my place around. Mm -hmm. And um... In 2008's uh, draft, uh, Charlotte Bobcats uh, selected to you with a 20 pick. And did you expect it to be uh, the first round pick? Yeah, I did expect it to be drafted, um, you know, in the first round. Uh, all my workouts was with big names, big men, you know. Uh, so I had Roy Hibbert, I had Javon McGee, DeAndre Jordan, uh, Morris Space was in there as well. Um, so it was like big names, big mans that was I had to play against all the time. And uh, I had great feedback after after everything was done, you know, like coaches and everything. 
were ever telling me I was the best big man that day at that workout, or uh, they were telling me I was, you know, the second best. So I was very confident in myself. So when I came back after, uh, you know, I was done with all my workouts, and I think I, I had 14 workouts in an amount of two weeks, which is a lot. So I was just go back and forth for the time. Um, but my agent basically tell me, like, you know, be expected to be dropped in the first round. So, uh, yeah, I was actually expecting to be, I wanted to be drafted like in the uh, top 10 or closer to 10, but pick 20 is just still, still an amazing accomplishment. And I'm, I'm just curious about the, the workouts, uh, because I think that there is one of these uh, aspects, uh, special uh, for the rookie or the future rookies, uh, it's one of the behind the sand. How, how it looks like, because from fan perspective, probably there are a couple of people from uh, from a coaching staff, uh, some general manager, and they're looking at you. You've got one or two hours uh, to, to show your all abilities and your strengths. And is it the bigger, uh, a bigger stress than playing on the game or is it different? I think I thought it was bigger than the stress was like bigger than the games. Uh, because you really have to show everything you can in that amount of time, um, you know, and also kind of like you have to have a good attitude, uh, encouraging your teammates, even though you don't even know none of them, everybody's fighting for that spot at the draft, um, but you have to encourage the guys and you got to show up, you know, you got to show up, be able to make all your shots and everything and just impress them with something. So it was very stressful, um, but uh, the, the workouts are just like very draining. Like you do a lot of, uh, a lot of tests, like, you know, how fast you can run from uh, one cone to those, or um, how high can you jump? Um, how fast can you play defense and stuff like that? You know, like uh, the GDD work is just amazing. And then after that, you know, you just play a little bit of one-on-one, -on -one, two and two and three and three. And, if they have five guys that play, you play five on five. Um, so you can see, they can see everything. Mm -hmm. And what did surprise you the most when you appear in the NBA? Or what did you, uh, you didn't expect to, to be at this level? Uh, well, coming from France, what surprised me the most uh, was the amount of uh, fans in the stands. You know, like, I mean, Anywhere in Europe, you may have the max probably like eight thousand play uh, eight thousand fans, or may you know for the big big arenas. Uh, over here, it's like fifteen to twenty, you know. So it's it's big, you know. And you know, so when you're not used to that, you know, you get very stressed um, in the first couple of games. For so for me, I, I came from an arena it was like, and the good days, five thousand five thousand fans. In the good days, <laughs> and it's not that hard, that not that often. And then when I came, it was an NBA game, and boom, it had like ten plus uh, thousand fans. I was very very nervous, um, but it's it's just like you know that, and also like the, everything that goes with it, um, the fans, the the music, and you know the the kids come around, and the, everything that goes with the NBA is just amazing to be a part of. Mm -hmm. And also. Uh... Charlotte Bobcats uh, were, are well known, were well known uh, from Michael Jordan as uh, then minor minority owner, and uh, later uh, he, well, he became a majority owner of, of the team. Uh, when did you meet him for the first time? Uh, I think I met him when we came here um, with those guys uh, for right after the draft. So for the press, and uh, we met him in his office. He talked to us a little bit, and uh, and then after that, you know, he he was coming time to time uh, on practice, not that often, uh, but most of the time we always see him during the games. He was there on the games all the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, during the practice, did you uh, did he also try to play one on one or giving you some advice uh, how to play, how to move on the court? Well, he didn't give no, no advice to me. I was a big man, so, you know, it's this different position. Um, I mean, even so, he still told me to do some certain stuff, but, you know, we, 
it was different positions. So it was just going about what he knows. Um, but uh, yeah, I think he uh, he did play a one on one versus um, Gerald Wallace. Mm -hmm. um, but it was not really a serious one on one. It was more like a fun one. Um, but yeah, I mean, he uh, he used to come and challenge certain guys a little bit, but not not quite often. Mm -hmm. And also uh, in uh, Charlotte Bobcats, uh, your your coach was Larry Brown, one, one of the uh, one of the best coaches in the, from the very first decade of twenty uh, uh, one first century. How do you remember your cooperation with him? Uh, it was tough. Um, he is very tough on. Uh, I mean, he was very tough on rookies. Uh, he had a actually had a bad reputation about rookies. Like the, he does not like to play them. And I got there, and I felt like he, you know, I felt like he liked me. So um, we had a great relationship outside of basketball, and on the court, he was just very uh, demanding, which uh, which is good because you know you got coach like that when they demand a lot, they actually like you a lot. Um, so it was a it was a tough. Uh, I would say like love and uh, love and hate relationship a little bit. Um, because he was very tough on me. Um, but, you know, I think he, the, the way his approach may have been um, not wrong, but I've said like different than what I was used to, um, that helped me to be able to be stronger mentally. Um, basically like, okay, I'm going to listen to what he has to say. But at the same time, I'm still a great player and I'm still going to show what I can do. So that's that's the way I, I approached the game after that, and uh, it was great. I mean, uh, I learned a lot with with Larry Brown, so he, he knows so much about the game. In July 2010, uh, you were traded with uh, Tyson Chandler to uh, Dallas Mavericks and stay in Texas for, for a while for, to January 2011. And then you were traded to Toronto Raptors, and uh, Tyson Chandler, Chandler uh, was still in uh, Mavericks when they won uh, the champions, NBA championship. Uh, did you feel uh, a bit unsatisfied with that? You were so close to be a team who got the ring. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, to this day, it's still, it's still, I still feel sour to me um, because. Before the training, I mean, before the training camp, I knew we had a good team. And during the during the training camp, I used to tell the cameraman every time you see me, he was having this camera on me. I was like, "Yo, we are gonna be number one. We're going to win." And you know, I used to laugh about it. I said, "No, I'm serious. We are going to win. I can see it. Uh, we, the team we have, the way we practice, how hard we practice, how hard uh, everybody was on the same page." So I was like, "I can't see it happening." You know, and, you know, I was a young guy, so nobody really paid attention to what I had to say. So when I got traded um, and the general manager um, called me and I, I told them, like, you know, I said, hey, listen, I'm pissed. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm mad at you. And he was like, why? I said, because I know I can feel it. I know you guys are going to win. And it's not fair for me to go to a team that at the time was Toronto. I love Toronto. The team and the city is amazing. But at the time, Toronto was the last team of the, of the, the season. Um, I think when I got there, they were like, they only had 12 wins or something like that, or 14 wins. And we finished with 25 or something like that. Uh, so yes, yeah, so I was I was for one of the best team to one of the lowest team, and I was like, oh my god, <laughs> what's going on? Um, but um, yeah, just sour. I didn't get my ring, but it's okay. And after uh, after this season, you uh, you came back to Europe uh, to France, and uh, one of the fans uh, asked the question from a current perspective: uh, Do you regret this move? Or was it necessary to become better and come back to, to the NBA? I don't regret that move. I had a, amazing years um, playing for Strasbourg in France. Uh, the fans and the team was perfect for me. Uh, I made some great, uh, some great uh, teammates there. And so it was awesome for me. And so I don't regret anything out of it. It actually helped me to become a better player. Um, it helped me to work more on my craft, on my uh, post move, on my shots. 
Um, and I think his, that's what helps me to be able to come back to the NBA. Um, a lot of players, when they're out of the NBA, it's extremely hard for them to come back. We don't see that quite often to be able to come back to the NBA. And uh, the fact that I got an opportunity to come back and then sign a, a big extension after that was uh, was major for me. So uh, I definitely think it helped me a lot, and I don't regret that move at all. And when you were on the court, do, do you feel that when you play against uh, big, uh, big players, centers and power forwards, uh, did you feel that they are tougher with you because uh, you've got NBA in your uh, in your uh, uh, circulum vitae, or was it the same uh, cooperation like with other players? Uh, no, I definitely think I had um, definitely thought I had like a big target on my back um, because of that. You know, like a lot of um, players that were maybe uh, like the same age as me, that like my same generation, they wanted to prove that them too could have been, they should have been in the NBA. Um, so, so yeah, I definitely had a target on my back and some players, they were older, so they sure wanted to teach me a lesson, um, but end up, it was me to teach them that lesson. So. And did some of them, uh, also appear in the NBA in the future from your opponents uh, during this period in the French league? I think it was... Um, we played a Turkish team, I think it was Fernabache, and the big man, uh, uh, was it Erson, maybe? Uh, yeah, they ended up going to the Boston Celtics after that, uh, after that year, or the year, the two years after. But yeah, that's, the, I think that's the only player. Mm -hmm. And in 2013-14 for, uh, season, you came back to uh, NBA. Uh, to New Orleans Pelicans, we could see uh, the jersey on, on the wall of the 42. Yeah. Uh, do you have got your top three moments from uh, this period uh, when you play for Pelicans? Or top five, if there were, well, you were more, this kind of memories? Uh, top five, I've said my first game back. Uh, didn't score that much. I think it was important. Didn't score that much, but I grabbed uh, 11 rebounds. Um, and I think it was in 10 minutes, so it was great. Um, I think after that, like a couple of the games after that, uh, they gave me more playing time and end up dunking on Roy Hibbert. Uh, so that's one of the good moments too. Um, I would say the, the, the time that we, uh, had our back against the wall and we had to win a game, absolutely like a game. Uh, that last game was against the Spurs to be able to uh, go to the playoff and we won the game. So it felt like we it kind of felt like we won the championship because it, the fans were crazy. We were very happy about it. We were, it was the first time since the Pelicans name was in the, in the city that we were going to the playoffs. So it was awesome. Uh, I would say one of the greatest moments too is Anthony Davis was hurt. And I think uh, Ryan Anderson was hurt at the time too. So I ended up starting the game and we were playing uh, Miami Hit and uh, ended up having my uh, career high on that game. Um, I think it was 24 points and the team was doing bad and I ended up helping the team to win this game. Um, and that was at the time that we were ready on the playoff run uh, to get to the playoffs. So we, we could not miss any games. And uh, my biggest game was uh, against, uh, the, it was the last game of Kobe Bryant in, in New Orleans. Uh, so everybody was, you know, wearing the purple and gold around. So I took that personally and uh, ended up scoring 28 points and 15 rebounds. So mm -hmm. that's my, my best memory I had there. And did Kobe after the game told you a good game? He did. Uh, he talked to me a little bit. He said, uh, good game. Keep on playing like, like this. You have a great potential. And, uh, you know, like I love that. And I wanted to keep going, but then I didn't have the same opportunity after that uh, from the coach, you know, so uh, it's different. Mm -hmm. And also uh, you've got a successful career uh, with uh, French national team. Uh, in 2013, uh, you won a gold medal uh, during the tournament in Slovenia. Uh, you were the best in rebounds and blocks uh, in in your team. 
And uh, how do you remember this tournament? It, was it tough for sure with the Spain after this overtime uh, game? But when you look at the tournament, tournament as a whole, uh, was it difficult for a team? Um, it was, I would say at the beginning, the first round was difficult because we, um, we thought like we were so good and everything and we ended up losing. I think it was, a, uh, I forgot which team that we lost and we were not supposed to lose that game. And, uh, so then the media was all of us at home saying like, we are not going to pass the second round and stuff like that. Um, before the, before the whole tournament, um, we had so much backlash because, you know, uh, of course, in the big man, we were supposed to have Joachim Noah that said he was not coming ever again in, with a national team. We were supposed to have Kevin Serafin that also said he cannot make it this year. Jan Mahimi that said he cannot make it. So then I came in into the picture and at the time I was coming from the French championship. And it was me and Joan Petro that was coming from the NBA. And they both, both of us, we got so much backlash home. They were like, oh, we have terrible centers and it's not going to be good and we're not going to do nothing. So, so yeah, I mean, it was, it was a hard to get into competition with that much backlash from medias and fans and everything. So after the first round, we lost one game, but everything came back on us. And, you know, us, the two big men, too, and they were like, well, we're terrible. We can do it. And uh, second round happened. Um, we, lo we lose again against Serbia. Um, and I think, they, I think they, they got us pretty good. I think we lost by 20 or something like that, close to 20. Uh, we were down 20 almost to so old game, and we probably came back towards the end. Um, but, yeah, we lost against them. And I think we, lo we lose against Lithuania, too. And um, and yeah, and then it, so then it was it was very tough for us. So we ended up going into a quarterfinal. Uh, I think we played uh, Slovenia or yeah, Slovenia or Lit Latvia. I think it may be one of those two. And we ended up, we ended up winning. And uh, and then the, the the semifinal was the Spain. You know, the team that we wanted to avoid as much as we could because. Somehow we could not play against them. We had trouble to play against them every time. Uh, so we were trying to avoid them. And we ended up playing them in, in the semifinal. And that was the, to me, I think it was the final before the final. Um, because that game was very, very intense. Uh, I think it might be the game, the most watched game in the entire tournament. Uh, and I uh, ended up going over time. And we all the way to the end till, you know, Marc Gasol, had a opportunity to tie the game and missed the three at the end, you know. So that was a incredible game in the final. We ended up winning the, the final by 20 points against Lithuania. Mm -hmm. And also, when uh, when I look at your um, at your, at your career, um, you the last time when you played in the NBA was when you got 28 or 29 years old, then came back uh, for a while to to the France. And did you try to come back to the NBA or the injuries cause uh, the moment that you decided to retire? Well, I did not. I, I haven't uh, retired officially mm -hmm. uh, yet. So, I mean, we'll see when I'm going to do that, if I decide to do that. Um, so, so far, I mean, why I try to come back to the NBA uh, a lot of teams was talking about they, they're trying to go younger, um, you know, into the paint, trying to go younger. And uh, and then after that, I had an opportunity to go overseas. And, uh, and then I figured out that overseas, it was just harder for me with my kids because my kids and my wife live in the United States. So it was harder for me to be away from everybody. Mm -hmm. And also... Uh when we are talking about kids, uh, one of the fans asked about uh, your son' name, which is Carter. Carter, and mm -hmm. uh, he was curious: uh, does it mean that uh, Vince Carter was also one of your favorite players? But you didn't mention about him in the beginning of our conversation. No, I, I mean I really looked up to uh, Vince Carter. He's uh, he's one of the reasons why I love North Carolina, the uh, University. 
um, because I used to have on my computer all his uh, best dunks and highlights uh, in my computer, and I used to watch them uh, weekly, daily. Um, so yeah, I definitely look up to him. Um, but uh, now the name Carter was not for that. Uh, actually, the name Carter is my wife that chose it. And uh, I was like, all right, well, let's go with Carter. It's fine. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, when I check your um, profile at Instagram, I see that you launched or soon will launch uh, the, a book. Uh, is it a biography? It's a little bit of biography. So basically, I would, uh, I'm talking about a little bit of my experiences and everything. But it's mostly like, what is it? What is it like to be different? Um, so you know, I'm I'm seven two two eighteen in uh, in in centimeters. And basically, it's a book to uh, self self love and wellness. And uh, I'm giving a lot of tools for people that are different. So anybody that you know that consider themselves skin too skinny or too fat or too tall or too too little too short, um, they can identify themselves to that book. Um, because, you know, basically I'm just telling them, just forget about it, everything, what everybody's saying and, you know, just go to the next step. So I'm helping a lot of people with the book. Mm -hmm. And uh, during your MBA career, I guess that you also um, uh, take a part of MBA CARES uh, program and uh, help the other people uh, with, with the poverty, with, with some educa educational lacks. And you've got the moments that uh, that you that, that somebody came to you and uh, to tell you told you thank you that what you what you are doing because it uh, makes uh, help me to believe that I could change something in my life and uh, that the, the dreams comes true. Yeah, um, actually, you know, my uh, early on in my career, I helped some um, young students. Uh, to be able to afford like, you know, computers and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, about like right before pandemic, I got an email saying like, thank you so much. You actually helped me to become who I am today. Um, so it's very, uh, very um, a warming and happy feeling to be able to help someone. Um, that's exactly why, you know, during the pandemic, we are here in Charlotte because I live in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, we have, we have a lot of people, uh, a growing community as far as homeless people that lose their homes and stuff like that because of the pandemic. So uh, my wife and I decided to just go and provide a lot of meals for them, like over like over 200 meals for for everybody everybody that was there and blankets. Um, so we try to we try to do as much as we could to be able to help in the, the community. Mm -hmm. The last question is. Uh... You play with uh, a lot uh, of uh, future future or current Hall of Fame uh, players with the All Stars. If you could create it uh, all time, Alexis Aginsa teammates team, who would you select it? As far as good teammates, or as far as the my best top five starting five, it could be both. Okay. Um. Well, point guard, I think it's an easy one. It's Tony Parker. Um, I don't think you can go away from one of the best point guard uh, in Europe and also in the NBA. Um, so Tony Parker and the, and the point guard at the two. At the two, who I will put at the two. That's a good question at the two. Um, at the two, I, I probably would put uh, Drew Holiday. Um, I played with him in New Orleans uh, because he's a great guy, great family guy, and also like a tremendous uh, player. A lot of people don't give him that much credit. I know you can. Play, I know he's a, he's a point guard, but he's a two. Uh, to me, I think he's he is very good as a two uh, as, as well. Um, as a three, it's a good question. Is a three? Uh, as a as a three, I probably put um. Jesus, that's a good question. We could skip it for a moment and going to the to the fourth. Yeah, four. I mean, four. I put uh, Dirk Nowitzki. 
because I mean he's the best one. And then if I have to put uh, as far as my teammate, I put uh, I mean I put uh, Anthony Davis as a five. In the three, it's ever between Karan Butler because I think he was an amazing player. Um, or I'm gonna have to move like a, a two a position two guy to the third to the third to the to the third spot. It's probably gonna put uh, Demar Derozan. Mm -hmm. Okay, Alexis. It, it was my last question, so I'm really happy that we got the opportunity to, to talk about your career and also about staffs uh, and. Uh, your uh, your um, activities after uh coffee career which is not yet with the dot at the end so mm -hmm. thank you very much uh, enjoy the day and uh, i hope that your book will also find a lot of readers thank you thank you i really appreciate that thank you for having me okay thank you